Hello, everyone. Hi there. Thank you all for being here today. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, my name is Nicola Hendricks. Um, my partner, Rachel Minerding. We are the Concept Art Association. We are an advocacy organization that's committed to elevating um, the profile of artists working within the entertainment industry. Um, and so when our board member, Carla Artis, um, brought this conversation to us, and we've been hearing a lot of people talking online about it, we wanted to create a safe space for this conversation to happen and to exist. Um, Conspire Association really focuses on making like safe, positive, kind conversations. So just keeping mindful of that spirit. Um, if anybody is messaging you something inappropriately, I'm Troll Patrol, so please send me a DM. Um, we've never had a problem in four years, but you never know. Um, and just at the end of the day, um, our goal is to just have an informed community conversation. Um, so with that said, Ms. Carla, please take it away. Oh, I'm sorry, Rachel, did you have anything to say? No, the only thing I was going to say is don't be offended if you're muted. Uh, it'll be just a mass mute. Um, so if you're speaking and you get cut off, turn your, turn your, uh, um, your uh, uh, microphone back on. But that's just so that we can hear what everyone has to say. Great. And then also the chat will be going the whole time. So if you have a question, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, and yeah, and with that, Carla, please take it away. Hi. First and foremost, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks to all the guests and thank you to the Concept Art Association for making this space for this conversation. Um, I do have a little presentation ready for all of you just to kind of get this conversation started and going. Uh, let me adjust one of my thingies here. So basically in the past, like four months to feel like everywhere I turn, I just hear AI, AI, AI. And, you know, being a human connected on the internet, it's, it's hard not to see the progress of these incredible tools and the software. But for those of you who might not be as, you know, into the now or might not have a full understanding what's going on, we're gonna take a little tour before we get started on our town hall, just to kind of set the conversation and, and share with you a little bit of what we've learned, particularly what I've learned. So basically what is, but, but, but before we get, get into it hardcore though, I do wanna give you guys kind of a feeling of like what is the outline and what we are going to be expecting into this. Um, town hall. Basically, we're going to do our brief introduction. Then later on, we're going to kind of open discussion in the town hall. Some of the subjects that we hope to kind of tackle on in this discussion will be a brief introduction, will be impact, and you know, I'm sorry, brief introduction would be the impact issues, solutions. And by the way, sorry, I had a little bit of a technical oops, which is why I'm like, where did my like note go? <laughs> there we go. You're just like, this lady makes no sense. Hey, I'm talking to a lot of people. It's a little nervous and anyway um so we hope to talk about impact issues solutions these subjects that are going to you know that a lot of us are going to have to tackle and are going to have to learn and are going to have to think about uh shortly after our open town hall discussion we will be doing a short q a um we do expect this conversation to be so in depth, because there's so much to talk about that we're not sure how much time we can, you know, give to Q and A. But we do hope to um, give the space for that. So please do send your questions uh, via chat, um, and then afterwards we'll have a closing. With that said, let's get started. So, for those of you who might not know exactly what AI is, um, in the visual image category. These software tools have been just incredible, incredible, incredible. Um, we don't have time to go into the history of it, but where we are right now is basically you will type a prompt or a series of descriptions and through a series of processes, each software will give you a very different image. Um, these uh, slides showcase each of the softwares available to us, at least the major ones and the ones that will be the focus of our discussion today. It will be Midjourney, Dali, and Stable Diffusion. 
uh, the prompt for this is basically behind the scenes of shooting the moon mining. Hollywood studio, 1969, backstage photography, you know, astronauts, actors. And then, then this is what the AI taking these prompts has generated for us. But it can do other things too, like pixelated imagery. This one's pixel art, a beautiful vaporware sunset with palm shadows, BOS games, retro pixel games, 1990s screenshot, <laughs> pixel game, art DOS game. They can get very intricate, these prompts. And that's supposed to be part of it. The more intricate and the more detailed the prompt, the better the image the AI can give you. Here's another example of a vaporware underground swimming pool. So it can do realistic photography. It can do, you know, pixelated artwork. It can do dreamy landscape. Whoop. And this is, I did this in a presentation. We're doing this live. <laughs> Um, anyhow, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, and it can also regenerate things that would come, you'd come to expect from like a, pic, you know, Pixar studio. Like, for example, this one, it's Pixar movie, scene of Dark Skull Wizard fighting against Kermit the Frog, you know, which brings up a lot of questions like, one, what is going on with this face? But also two, <laughs> you know, like, can we utilize Kermit the Frog for these things? But we'll get to that in, through our discussion. But we want to just kind of give you an idea of what these tools can generate right now and where are they at. But, you know, again, going back to this, it's just like these are the main companies that we'll be focusing on. Midjourney is in the U.S. Dali is in the U.S. as well. And Stable Diffusion is in the U.K. But how does this actually work? I'm gonna give you all just a very quick little description. Please note, I am not the engineer in the panel. I am not the expert in the panel. I'm just an artist, <laughs> but I wanted to give you just a little description of how these things are created. So it all starts basically with a data set. Data sets are images across the, all the internet gathered by the practice called data scraping. Sometimes this practice happens, you know, painstakingly by hand. Um, other times it's done in large quantities by machines. When it's done by machines though, it's really difficult to curate what goes on in, in these data sets, which means like, for example, copyrighted data, private data, violet images, pornography, and all these things go into these like massive data sets. When you type a prompt, then that's when the AI kind of starts and begins its journey by grabbing the image date from the data set. How it recognizes and how it knows what to look for is by looking at the tags of each, of each image. A tag is basically just like a description of what the image shares. So if you ever go into Google or if you ever look at like Getty images and look, you know, search something by the tags, person, running, you know, party, all these things, that's, those are, you know, the tags that the AI then goes to find. Afterwards, it goes into this process of deep learning. As the AI starts to gather the data, it starts to find kind of a commonality between the tags. It associates descriptions of images and, you know, the text and the tags all together. Like, for example, it will break down a concept like banana into various different, you know, descriptions and, and find commonalities between it, like the color yellow, the fruit, the shape, etc. As it continues to make these associations between description tags and large prompts, it creates a really deep kind of web of associations. Uh, and basically it just increases its visual vocabulary. The next step in all this, or basically once all the lessons the AI has learned has been gathered, they kind of get compressed into one central space called the latent space. Essentially, again, as mentioned, this kind of like a representation of compressed data and similar data points are closer together in space, or at least that's what like a fancy researcher <laughs> told me. <laughs> but this is one of the reasons why Midjourney looks a little bit different from Dali, 
and why these, you know, softwares all look a little bit different, at the very least for now. One of the things um, about it is there is, you know, once it gathers all this data, one of the things it does, it goes through a process called generation. And the particular one and the most common one that we, we know is the process of diffusion. And what basically happens is that the software kind of breaks down all the data gathered and shreds it apart into little like bits of noise. And as it grabs the prompts and as it's you know, directed by the prompts, it starts grabbing little bits of shredded data from all over the place and kind of slowly reintegrate it to, can, to pretty much create a new image. Um, I'm definitely oversimplifying this as this is a very deep mathematical model and there's actually very different methods of generation. The fusion is the one that we're just more commonly known for. And at the end of it, we have the output. So at the end of all this process, the software basically gives us a new or as some would kind of call it a remixed image. It just really depends on the eye of the beholder. Um, the software is normally when you work with either Dali or Midjourney or Stable Diffusion or slash Dream Studio, you get a series of generated images. So no, it's not just one, you normally get four. And from this four, you can say, oh, I'm content with this image on the right, or say, hey, I like this image on the left, let's get more variations of that. And as you select that, it goes through this entire process altogether. Currently, the process can take anywhere from seconds to a couple minutes. Um, and this is where we're at right now, at the very least on the visual aspect of this. There are some questions we all have with each of these processes. And I think as the technology evolves and as the technology continues to reach more of a wider audience, we as artists and lawyers, governments, all of us will need to figure out these very basic questions for data sets. What do people do about data sets that contain private data or copyrighted data? What do people do about data sets that do contain violent images or things that could be very horrendous? For the deep learning, once we have all these data sets and the AI makes, you know, these like, you know, learns these lessons from the images, can it ever forget if we're able to, you know, if we're just like, hey, you learned how to paint making the mouse, you shouldn't. Can, can it ever forget it? The same question kind of goes to the latent space. If a latent space is created with a lot of, you know, copyrighted material, violent material, or things that are just like iffy, like what does that mean for that, for that kind of shared lesson space? This degeneration process enough for it to be different? Is the generation enough for it to be something completely new? Or is it really just a glorified remix system? And is the output ours? The US uh, Copyright Office recently ruled that AI cannot copyright or cannot do any copyright. Um, so who owns that? Um, these are all questions we really need to be asking. But for the purposes of this particular discussion, we've identified our two main things that we'd like to talk about. We'll, we'll likely venture to other things, of course, but these are where most of our questions lie and where some of our guests have a lot of experience with, so we will likely focus here. But let's take a second back and look back at the, you know, at the companies themselves, because there's a lot of information that we need to know about them, just a little bit more, I promise we'll be done soon. So let's talk about the data sets, because data sets are pretty much everything for, you know, the AI software. What do we know about each of the companies? For example, Midjourney's data set is private. We don't know anything about it because they haven't published it publicly, at least to our knowledge. Um, however, one of the things that's interesting is when you write a prompt of a celebrity or an artist's work, the software does recognize that. 
And it does make things that mimic either that celebrity or that trademark or that artist. Um, we have asked around the, to the developers. Well, I have asked around to the developers. And it's like, do you, you know, what can you share about your data set? Just because it is a curious thing. And they briefly have mentioned through discussions, uh, both online and private, that they do seem to use the internet as well. So it's a similar model to Lion 5B. We'll talk about that in a second. So when a, in, when a database contains so much information, then it definitely could have copyrighted data, private data, violent imagery, and all kinds of stuff. Dali under, is also you know, a bit private. And it's important to note, Dali is the biggest company out of all of these. It has around 200-ish employees, last I checked. And it, it does have a lot of more um, institutional backing. Um, However, it, when you type in an artist's work or celebrity likeness, you cannot get, um, you know, the, the generated image does not return looking like the artist's work. And in some cases, the, the, the prompts are blocked. For example, if you were to type someone like Angelina Jolie or a celebrity or a politician, it actually stops you from doing that. Um, it does, but by the way that it reacts to typing in an artist's work, it doesn't seem like it's using the entire internet. It could be that either the data sets are more closely curated or there are other technical limits being imposed here. And lastly, stability AI. Um, now it's Stability D Diffusion Dream Studio. That's their, the name of their actual for-profit entity. And it is there. It's the only one of the three major companies that I've listed here that does allow for public view of their data set. Their data set is called Lion 5B, and that is 5B stands for 5.8 billion images within its data set. It 100% does allow for artwork likenesses, celebrity likenesses, trademark likenesses, you name it. I have seen actors being depicted in crazy images. I have seen all kinds of trademark parties in there. It, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't, it allows you to pretty much do anything you like. Um, and because the data sets are actually viewable online, you can actually find copyrighted, you know, copyrighted data, private data. So yes, it is 100% contains this. Let's also take a look at the for-profit aspect of these companies, because it's important to keep in mind that, yes, as exciting as the software AI tools are, there are people that are profiting from it. Um, so Midjourney has a subscription model. It ranges from anywhere from $10 a month to $600 per year. Um, DALI does a credit, you know, per, per generation credits model. So basically every time you write a prompt, that's a generation. So every time you write a prompt and say, do me a picture of someone partying and dancing and having a great time, you know, in Muppet form, then that will charge you one credit. And you get a kind of like a free credits per month. But if you want more than that, you, you have to pay $15 on top. Um, Stable Diffusion Dream Studio also does per generation credits. I think out of all of them is the one with like more structured um, credit structure. So basically about one pound for every 100, you know, generations all the way to like 1000 pounds for every 100K generations. And this includes like whenever you have like the first initial pass, you know, of the visual generations and saying, oh, I'd like to see this revisited over and over and over again. These are the profit models for now. Of course, all of these are subject to change. And lastly, a lot of these companies do, in their terms of service, grant commercial rights. So this, to me, is a very kind of legal gray area, like a big question mark, because as we do, we have seen, like, the process could contain copyrighted data. So if the process does contain copyrighted data, can they grant commercial rights? And by doing this, they're also kind of saying it's the user that gets the copyright. It's a, it's a big question mark. But... Basically, all of them 
uh, mid journey, DALI, and stable diffusion, you know, depending on the user packages, of course, um, do grant uh, commercial rights, including commercial use. Um, it's interesting, it's important to note as well that it starts. And it's not that it starts, it feels like it's starting, but it's honestly been going on for quite a while. But there are plans, you know, to expand to other areas. If you take a look at like any kind of like AI and, you know, developer or any kind of, you know, investor in this space, they're always discussing about the possibilities and the, the, about the exciting things that are happening in the space. And we're going to see an expansion in audio, in animation. 3D, editing, scripts, design, compositing, UI, all of this. Um, this is an anecdotal, so I cannot present this as evidence per se, but there is a push and an excitement to create things that are basically like AI-generated films or AI-generated games. We're still a bit of a long ways from now, but, you know, there's definitely an expansion of this technology happening. And considering where we were four months ago to where we are now and just a visual aspect alone, it's, it's both exciting and a little, you know, like we'll see what's happened. But basically our question, you know, or my question, and I know that it's the question of many of the peers is where the humans fit in all of this? You know, what will be the laws be like? And what will be the ethics of the now and the future? Because these are very pivotal moments in this technology's history. So how can we best shape it if we can? With that said, I uh, like to <clears throat> open the panel. I mean, the panel, I'm so used to panels. I'd like to open the town hall up and I'd like for us to introduce our guest. Nicole, do you want to lead that? Yeah, um, maybe let's, perfect. Um, so we have Lauren here. I actually didn't realize I was introducing people, so I hadn't practiced last name. So Lauren, I apologize. I'm going to put oh, your so name. Sorry. Can um, did it do it? Yeah, please. <laughs> I mean, I can do it myself. It's okay. All right. okay no problem. No problem. Uh, let's start with Lauren. Lauren Penapinto, can you go? <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, Carla, first of all, thank you for doing such a wonderful overview of, of you know, the issues in the process and, and just a good starting point for folks. I know that there's probably people coming to this that are very familiar with it and not at all familiar with it. So it's great. And thank you to the um, folks that are that set this up and your great organization and just, you know, I've been watching the chat go by and it is 99.9 percent respectful and calm so that's good um which is which is i think the most important thing and and you know i'm my name is lauren Pampinto. hi i'm introducing myself so thank you to everybody but i'm the creative director of uh, orbit books and uh, a vp of Hachette books our parent company so my place is i commission a lot of artists to make a lot of book covers and book interiors and, and book stuff so i am a traditional creative director art director um, who hires people artists to make art for commercial purposes. Um, Frank, Frank Ganello, can you go next? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm Frank Ganello, uh, or as Carla refers to me from my gaming and Discord <laughs> name, just call me Frank. Um, so I'm a principal product attorney for uh, Cruise Ride Hail Services in San Francisco. It's an AI related, uh, but tangential uh, self-driving car company. Uh, prior to that, I was privacy and data counsel at PlayStation, uh, working with uh, PlayStation Studios uh, and the franchise and the different IPs there as well. Uh, Abhishek Gupta, do you mind going next? Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Abhishek Gupta, uh, the founder and principal researcher at the Montreal AI Ethics Institute. Uh, it's an international nonprofit research institute with a mission to democratize AI ethics literacy. Uh, I also serve as the senior responsible AI expert and leader at the Boston Consulting Group. Um, and prior to this, I worked as a machine learning engineer at Microsoft, uh, building production grade ML systems. So uh, this is sort of the perfect intersection of all of my you know, interest areas, the work that I do. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to uh, you know, chat with Carla a few days ago and uh, I was telling her, that, you know, uh, the impact of AI on society is what I live and breathe. So 
Uh, thank you for having me. Looking forward to this. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Christian Elsman, do you want to step up? Uh, hi. Uh, thanks, Carla and Concept Art Association for doing this. Um, I hope it will ease a lot of people's uh, possible anxiety. I'm a uh, concept design supervisor at Lucasfilm, and before that, I was at ILM for, oh, many years. <laughs> um, and yeah, and uh, essentially like an illustrator, concept designer. And finally, uh, Mr. Mullins, do you mind stepping up? Hello, can you hear me? Just fine. Oh, excellent. And I also would like to thank Carla and Rachel and Nicole for doing this. And I'm not just saying that, I really do thank you and appreciate you for doing this because it is really important. Uh, my background is I, uh, I was trained as an industrial designer at Art Center and um, then went back to Art Center, studied illustration, and I've been doing it for a long time. So I've seen uh, a kind of a big uh, section of history with this stuff. Thank you, all of the guests. Yeah. So now we're going to um, open this up just to a little bit more of a discussion. Um, we do hope to hit as many topics as possible, uh, but you know how it goes with time. Um, but let's get started. Uh, Nicole, Rachel, do you guys have any specific questions or do you want to get started right away? Um, I think a lot of the stuff that's kind of coming up in the, in the chat, which kind of ties into one of the reasons why we're here is this issue of who owns the copyright like um regardless of how these data sets are being gathered they're gathering it copyrighted material either the artist's private um you know violent images pornography um i'd love to kind of you know maybe frank or, or um ari want to kind of weigh in on on mm -hmm. some of those implications of of what that you know of what that of what the the state of what's happening yeah, to, to maybe help rephrase that a little better and just kind of get a better sense. Um, maybe uh, Abhishek, how about we, we kind of start with that question with the how, how are these data sets gathered? Is to, what uh, considerations do people have? You know, what concerns there may be with that act, you know, and then we'll take it to Frank and his uh, thoughts on privacy data and potential. You, I know you're not an IP lawyer, but I know you can still comment <laughs> on some stuff. But what do you think, Abby? No, uh, thanks. And, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll maybe defer all the copyright stuff to, to, to someone else who is a, <laughs> a lawyer who at least has a law background and understands it. I, you know, come at that much more so from an ethical uh, perspective and, and sort of, you know, what that means. So, so when we're talking about, you know, how these data sets are collected, right, and it, it really varies, right, and that, I, I know that that's not a satisfactory answer, but it really varies in terms of how people go about doing data collection. So you can think about it in terms of a few buckets, right, so you've got cases where, uh, let's say it's a university, you know, commissioned, you know, IRB approved project, right? So you've got, you know, a PI, a principal investigator, and you've got, you know, some perhaps, you know, graduate students or whatever who is working with that PI and they, you know, want to build some sort of a data set for performing, you know, or for enabling a certain machine learning task. There, what you end up finding is that there are higher ethical standards because it's typically IRB approved. It's, you know, within the, you know, sort of auspices of a university or some sort of an institution which is going about doing that work. In such cases, when data is gathered, usually, you know, ethics are followed and, and, and the way that the data is released, you know, you, you have all of those considerations in place. Then you've got some, you know, of course, private data gathering that happens by companies who, well, you know, I don't need to say a lot about that. I think everybody's familiar with data mining and everything around that. And then you've got other sorts of, um, you know, data set curation, collection, and making it available which doesn't fall under any of these buckets and data is just, you know, so we, 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 we saw, uh, especially as COVID had started and sorry, this doesn't directly maybe talk about this, but at least it'll illustrate the point. Um, when, when COVID started and people wanted to see if facial recognition systems could perform well or not, uh, when, when people had face masks on some 
enterprising, meaning unethical actors in the space went to public Instagram accounts and, you know, people were still using Instagram when COVID, you know, started and, and they were wearing, you know, masks and they took those photos and use that to train up systems and then sell those capabilities to, you know, governments, health agencies, whoever, who wanted to be able to, you know, have performant facial recognition, you know, systems that could perform when, you know, people had masks on when that wasn't, you know, the case before. Of course, now, you know, it's a part of, you know, Apple, you know, face unlock and all of that stuff, like technology moves, which also, by the way, it moves really fast, right? Which, I mean, that's why we're here. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, very loosely speaking, like that's that's sort of, you know, the broad strokes of how data set curation and collection happens. I forgot what the other, I don't know if there was another question that you asked after that. No, no, or, that's that's no. very, that's very yeah. thorough. Thank you. Um, I think um, we can, we can kind of push it to, to Frank. It's like, how do we, you know, that there's that question of the copyright, but I'll also add the added layer of privacy into that um, because I've uh, when I talk to people and when people really find out how these things go whether they're positive towards technology or not the questions are always kind of central of wait can I opt out wait who owns this you know what 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 are your thoughts on on these issues as a as a lawyer yeah, so as usual, you know, the legal questions here are uh, prominent and gray, uh, and I probably won't provide a very clear answer because there generally isn't one yet. Um, I'll just, you know, preface everything I'm about to say by saying, you know, I'm an attorney by trade. My primary focus is in product and privacy, but I'm, uh, you know, experienced in talking about things in terms of risk. So this is like, both risk for the providers of these services and risks of the users who are generating stuff and then trying to do something with it. Um, and so for that, you know, I can speak to some of the copyright uh, concerns that I would have if I was advising, uh, say I was working for Stable Diffusion, trying to counsel them on their own product. Um, so I'm not a copyright expert, but uh, just getting that out there. Um, you know, you know, the good thing is that copyright laws have been around for a very long time and they still apply to your works. When you create them, they're protected. And there's different types of uses that come along with that, depending on how you protect them, how you choose to share them. Uh, somebody I saw posted the same link that Carla, you shared with me about exploring the data set. Um, and this, this ties into a couple of things that you brought up. So uh, when you explore the data set, you can see that. Uh, you know, certain information is indexed. It's the metadata that I think can be policed or uh, enforceable, where you see, you know, what met metadata is actually tied to these images. Um, and so, you know, for the people asking questions about, you know, your name and being associated with certain images, uh, generally speaking, I would, I would have to think that some of the privacy laws that exist today, uh, while not initially contemplating this kind of stuff, would probably apply to a business holding personal data about you. Personal data, especially in California, is defined extremely broad. Um, it's data that's even capable of being associated with an identifiable individual or household. Um, you know, I would see that, you know, if my name was tied to a bunch of different art that I had created, I feel that there would be some enforceability there uh, that the companies are probably big enough. They probably contain enough records or, you know, as this commercializes, they're probably subject to these laws uh, due to uh, gross revenue, but you could probably make data access and deletion requests from these companies. Um, depending on their legitimacy though, of course, you know, there's going to be some questions on whether they comply uh, and then, you know, whether the AG's office or other uh, data protection offices throughout the world are in, going to investigate that kind of thing. Um, the other aspect to this is, you know, where, what are the sources that this data is actually scraping from? And uh, there's, there's some debate on whether, you know, the, the, the work is actually, uh, technically speaking, whether it's a copy of the work in order to perform that analysis, whether there's, uh, whether that's actually a derivative work or not. But we can actually look back to see a large percentage of the data that was scraped came from Pinterest. And if you review 
Pinterest's terms of services, Pinterest uh, very much restricts this kind of activity. So uh, from my plain reading of what the Pinterest terms of service say and what this data set actually provides, it seems to me to be a violation of their terms of service. And that's something Pinterest could actually take action on. Uh, when you post to Pinterest and you review their terms of service, it doesn't say that you're foregoing all the rights to the works that you're posting. You're actually only giving it to Pinterest to perform Pinterest, to do its thing. Um, and so that I, th I think there's going to be some legal challenges there in the future. And I think the sources of this data are going to be something that's going to be very heavily litigated. And what I would be concerned with if I was counseling these companies uh, to be very careful where they're actually getting that data from. It's going to also be hard to prove. Uh, but as we've seen with this linked article, the researchers have done so. And it's it, it can be made available. Uh, it's probably just going to take some litigation to get there. Um, I know I'm taking up a lot of time and I'm kind of going off on tangents. We can cover more in Q&A, uh, but that's kind of my high level view of things. Absolutely. And, and that, that brings so many questions because, like, for example, um, a lot of the things that we're finding out is that this is very international thing that's occurring. So this isn't just a U.S. centric thing. This is also the U.K. This is the EU. And in things like, for example, in the EU, I've 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 scoured the GDPR <laughs> legal text. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but from my understanding, like there has to be some sort of consent and ability to reach to like right holders um, for consent. And there's a lot more. Yeah, like the, the, both both the U.S. and the EU as well have have certain you know rules towards what kind of data can be gathered, where can it be gathered from, and so for things like for example the Lion Five B, which has five point eight billion, um, you know images, this becomes a huge question, and especially as tools are being developed where you can now research the database and where they got it, got each image from. I bet that opens up a lot of questions. So Carla, but, we actually have an IP attorney in the chat. I don't know um, if we want ooh. Arka Chatterjee, if you have any interest in joining the fray, we'd love to hear an IP attorney on this. I think that'd be fantastic. I have other other questions, but yeah, if 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 they want to just kind of chime in on this. That was like no warning too. So we, we might should just circle back. Like, please raise yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to jump in for a second yeah. while we figure out. And again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a art director and creative director, but a lot of my job consists of learning enough intellectual property law to explain that both to the editors and publishers and to the artists I work with, um, you know, on the person that deals with the contracting and all that stuff. Um, I just want to remind the room because there's a lot of people who are not only not lawyers but don't deal with legal terms a lot in in necessarily in their art um art I, law always kind of catches up to technology you know the way that laws are made and this is what i went into i made a muddy colors article just you know a couple of weeks ago which is how i ended up here kind of but um law is built up over time especially intellectual property law and frank can talk you know, much more specifically to this. So just because there aren't, this is a very big gray area because it's very new and people haven't had time to go through the lawsuits. There isn't a case history built up yet. So things that are not necessarily defined now or legal now or legal now, you know, there's a very big difference. And, and this is what I try and, and teach artists and editors all the time. You know, it's not like what is legal and what is morally right are two separate things you know and and what we feel is morally right or wrong might be instantaneous but law takes time to to get to this so you know as a as a creative director as an art director who um you know has to generate you know get imagery custom imagery for work you know one of my concerns with this and what i tried to get across in in the muddy colors article was I would be concerned as an art director that anything I use from these platforms in this brand new early gray area period would not be legal down the road. And that's a potential hazard for me later. Do we have to recover books? Are we going to get sued by people? Things like that, like risk awareness and risk management is a huge part of my job. And that's what, you know, Frank started to speak to. So, you know, 
while this stuff, you know, it's very frustrating to people to not know what's legal or what's not yet. And, you know, what's legal here is not necessarily going to be what's legal in Europe and what's legal in California is not necessarily going to be legal in what's New York. And there are going to be people, especially these companies jumping into the fray and staking claim and hoping to hold on to as much rights as they can. But it doesn't mean that um, more wary art directors and the companies they represent are suddenly going to be like, oh, great, I never have to hire an artist again, you know? And that's besides like, we haven't even gotten to the quality of the images, the style of the images, anything like that. But, you know, I don't think there's a long line of art director, you know, there's been one or two places I saw in the Atlantic, you know, they did some AI generated art. It's gonna be a gimmick right away. And there are people gonna, that are gonna be jumping on it because it's a gimmick, but there are very real copyright concerns that would affect my job and my company. So it's not like I'm like, oh, ooh, ooh, I can't wait, you know? And I, th yeah, thank you. And I, and I saw in chat rather quickly about the LinkedIn case. I read about it, um, again, not a lawyer, but from my understanding is that even the courts, even though link, the courts basically were like, hey, yeah, data scraping is, is okay, it's legal. But it left a question of copyright data and private data unanswered. In fact, it's very, intentionally ambiguous to that and it gave the ability of data scrape very uh, you know it kind of went like this is what you can do but it hasn't quite solidified just yet and this is what you cannot do and different government agencies in the U.S. have responded differently as well for example the FTC uh, sued a company called Ever Everclear or no Ever Album and it found out that Ever Album broke its data, you know, privacy data promises. So it actually had Ever Album uh, delete its algorithms. It had Ever Album pretty much just, you know, cease to. So, so there's, there's so it again as Lauren Frank and everybody has mentioned. This, this is a gray area. It's evolving. Um, but, but I have a question because all of this kind of goes into like the technology aspect for Abby, like, let's say like we're five years ahead and someone decided, Hey, you know, the course decided, Hey, this is not correct. Um, you need to erase all copyrighted data from this, or, you know, unless someone decides to opt in, which by the way, opt-in should be the standard as opposed to opt out. Um, what, what does that look like on a technical level? Is that something possible right now? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's, so you, you, you're asking a hundred million dollar, maybe a billion dollar question. <laughs> it is. So, so right off the bat, the simple answer is, is incredibly difficult, right? That's, that's the simple answer. Um, there was a, a fascinating research paper in late 2018, I believe, from University of Toronto called Machine Unlearning. And it was, or it might've been, I think, 2019, actually, now that I think about it, because it, it came post GDPR. And, you know, with the whole idea of like, you know, right to be forgotten, the the implication was, well, if you have a trained model, there is, you know, very, very loosely speaking now, uh, a, you know, representations of your data that are learned, learned representation that are captured within the trained model. Um, and how do you get rid of that when someone makes such a request? And so machine learning essentially tried to do that. Uh, uh, now, I haven't really seen all that much come out after that that points out how you can extricate you know specific instances because again see the question is about removing specific instances of data right if you say hey like all of the data that you used was copyrighted or whatever and we need to get rid of it okay that's actually simpler in the sense that you just discard the entire model and you start from scratch but if you say hey you know some 10% non-contiguous and you mixed up with everything else. And again, I'm being very like loosey-goosey with the language here, but that's where it becomes really difficult to extricate that. So again, I think the current paradigm mostly is just you, you discard it and retrain. But again, let's not forget some of these are gigantic, gigantic models that consume millions of dollars in being able to train them. And let's not forget the environmental impacts that that creates because of the phenomenal amount of energy it consumes. But anyways, I mean, that's 
that's that's sort of where it's at. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, there's there's so much to discuss. I feel like we could have a whole four hours just in that little bit alone. <laughs> but um, I'd like to hear also from you know some of the artists in the room. Um, I'd like to hear from Christian and Craig. Like, let's start with you, Christian. Like, what are your you know, hearing all this and considering your thoughts on these technologies, like, what are your thoughts on this? How do you, you know, just a very big overview, the, the positive, the negative, where are you at right now? Where you at? I mean, like, like with Craig, I, uh, I'm sure, you know, Craig started before I did, but I mean, I started traditional and then everybody went up in arms about Photoshop and was like, oh, it's going to ruin this and ruin that. And, and then when 3D came in, people were saying the same thing. It's not um, a lot different, is it? it? It's not. It's not really. I, I, I feel at the end of the day, you're not going to have everybody um, out there. It's it, it's still this is still going to be a, a, a tool for artists. Uh, they're going to be the ones that use it well. Um, I think that because they're going to put the kind of time and love into learning prompts and stuff like that. Um, I, I think where it will come into play, especially for work like me, is you're going to have clients that are going to hand you artwork, copy, copyright protected or not. You're going to have a director working at 2 a.m. typing up a script in his bedroom, and he's going to want to see what his monster is going to look like. And you'll be given that possibly. And then and then that'll only be that type of director too. There's these types <laughs> that kind of that kind of poke with technology. And then they'll they'll give you that. And that'll be a place to start. I the concept artists and designers are still going to be needed to to make the finished thing, to do turnarounds of to finish the design, to you know, to give the final package to production. I mean, unless unless you can actually say uh, somewhere down the road, this thing can make a fully finished 3D turnaround, which maybe maybe eventually it can. But yeah, I'd say yeah, for right will. now, it will. It will be able to do that. Yeah. Well, then, you know, you, 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 I think you still need to you'll still need people, at least for the the, the meanwhile, who can implement and and make good sound creative decisions to get work finished solve problems in getting ready for this talk i uh, i ran a little i won't i won't name names but um i ran a little experiment to see what a non-artist was able to make with some of these platforms um and and because most of the folks experimenting with this and universally the good imagery we're seeing come out of this that's making everyone panic is from artists who are playing with these tools. Um, I assure you that the level of um, custom work, thought, composition, taste, clarity that um, an, an editor needs for a book cover, a publisher needs for a book cover, um, a magic card needs, you know, these, these highest level concept art, all of these things, um, you aren't, we're not there, uh, clearly. Uh, clearly the technology is gonna get a lot better, but the, the analogy I've been seeing in the way I eventually see this stuff being used and I was talking about in the chat is a lot like royalty-free stock photography. And everybody kind of panicked, at least in the photographer world, when uh, the photography world, when um, you know these giant powerhouses like iStock and Shutterstock put all of this imagery online, um, you know, you can go on Shutterstock and you can have a thousand book covers and you can have millions of, you know, pictures of this and that. Um, it never, it did not end photography. Um, do we use Shutterstock? I use Shutterstock as exchange, interchangeable for royalty-free photography, but you know what I mean? It's not just Shutterstock, but, you know, do we use those images on book covers? Absolutely. Do we 1000% need designers? Do we need illustrators? Do we need photographers? Yes, yeah, still, absolutely all the time. Um, I think that I see AI art becoming, no matter how good it gets at generating things that are specifically asked for, I do not ever see it taking the place of 
a thinking, breathing person who can have a conversation with you and an editor can say, I want this, do this, do that. Um, what it's going to do is take over the, the kind of the entry level usage, you know, um, you know, people who have small businesses who can't afford to hire designers and artists at a certain level go on Shutterstock and they download a logo and they use it for their restaurant. You know, it, that's the kind of level of stuff that I see AI taking over. And is that disruptive to the artist community? Absolutely. There are tons of artists that make a living at that level. But I think ultimately it's just going to be another tool that uh, we use. And this is, you know, copyrights aside, all of that conversation still needs to be worked out the same way that stock photography licensing and laws needed to be worked out. So, you know, I still, look, if, if robots get so good, if AI gets so good that my editor can dictate exactly what they want for a book cover, if an author can dictate exactly what they want for a book cover and a usable, good, unique image comes out that's a really good book cover, but as good as any of us can do, then it's not just artists that are going to have to worry. I think somebody said that in the chat, like they're coming for everyone. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's point. not just artists. Um, but I, I think it's, and I don't want to take up too much time. I, I think it's hard because I think I, I write all these articles on Muddy Colors about, and, I, and it comes to me over and over again, that artists don't understand why they're picked really a lot of the time for a certain job or a certain thing. And, and as an art director, it's, I, I, I swear to you, it takes so much, you know, if you've ever worked on a book cover and there's plenty of people on this chat that have and in this panel that have, um, you know, there's so much fine tuning. There's so much, oh, but we need it to be like this. Oh, we need it, but but she needs to look fiercer or she needs to look, you know, like these this, this conversation, it's a collaboration. You know, AI is not a collaborator, it's a tool. If it gets to the level of collaboration, then we're talking about all kinds of like, higher level issues that our ethics AI person can talk about, like soul and, you know, autonomy and all of those things. But it, it's not a collaborator. It's a tool. And we will always need the collaborator running the tool. Yeah, wonderful points. I, um, I feel Abby. like that was a mic drop right yeah, there, yeah. Lauren. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Abby, I, I know you probably have lots to say, but I do want to add um, that, Craig, I'd like to also uh, hold that thought, Abby, because, I'd, Craig, I'd like to see where your space has as well. I know Lauren is that's just like, blah, blah, but I'm sure <laughs> go for it. Uh, can, can you hear me? Just fine. Just fine. OK, good. Um, this is so difficult to, to jump into. It's such a, a puzzle. But um, first thing on, on like uh, uh, people worrying about uh, copyright and, and the right to be forgotten. And, you know, that is something that is big in Europe. I mean, you can. But really be honest with yourself. Why, why do you not want to be included in this database? Is it financial? Is it moral? Is it sour grapes? What is it? What What is motivating your desire to is it really just a visceral reaction to a threat which it might be so if you really have solid reasons for doing it i think in the end if you think carefully about it, you say well i probably do want to be in this database and the database really isn't any different than having copyrighted images on google search because google makes a lot of money by having those images in its search database and how is it really different than being in an ai database well it isn't so I know, Carly, you wanted us not to get uh, philosophical and be more um, <laughs> practical about this, but I really don't see any way that you can not do that. And, and okay. I think that oh, you, know, absolutely, yeah. you, you have to think about like getting back to the nature of consciousness. And I know that sounds very woo woo, but it really isn't. And one of my favorite thinkers on this subject is uh, Daniel Dennett who attempts to explain consciousness without any type of, uh, I, I guess he would call it magical organs, you know, a very deterministic view of human beings. And, and you could say that, well, I'm, I'm, I like that because human beings, you know, there is no magic in the box, the Cartesian theater, as you would call it, you know, where he doesn't believe that. But thing is, is if you do believe that, then that means there's nothing magical there, which means, this idea of, well, there's something soulful about a human being that an AI would never be replaced. Well, if you have a mechanistic view of humans, 
then it will be duplicable by AI. And I remember years ago, they tried to take a chimpanzee and raise it as a human uh, child to see if it would develop speech. It didn't because it didn't have certain uh, structures in the brain to actually do that. But uh, I could see raising an AI as a human being. <laughs> it's first crush. It's, <laughs> you know, it, it, it is possible to do this and it will. So, it, and, and these things are only going to get better as time goes on. So as, as far as like, us being replaced by them, uh, and and the, and the word of need has something. Will we need artists? Actually, what's going to happen in the future is there is not going to be a need. You're going to decide whether or not you want to be, because eventually the wealth created by these things is going to be so huge that you won't need to do anything. And I, that's and, and I know this is tilting toward the utopian side of things, but I, I really am a techno optimist about a lot of things. I think humans are like kudzu. You cannot kill them. So, I mean, just try to get rid of cockroaches and you can't do it. I think humans with their adaptability are pretty much the same. So it's all like, we're on the edge of extinction. No, we are not even close. So, um, yeah. Anyway, okay, I've spewed it off. Thank you. No, no. <laughs> Thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, this is one of the reasons why we really wanted to get a variety of, of thoughts. Um, there's there's so many really, really interesting points that you've brought up. Um, just to, just to kind of kind of uh, share a little bit on on the the mood of the chat, like there's the central question of consent, right? Like, and I think that's one of the things moving forward because, in the same way that I want to be able to opt out, I'd love to be able to be a part of it. And at the end, I think that should be left up to a, like a personal choice in the aspect of, oh gosh, I, I should have done a note because you just brought a million one beautiful points. Um, but in the aspect of like AI, you know, becoming human in a more philosophical aspect. So I'm breaking my own rule of like, let's not get philosophical fellas. Um, I think a lot about how, you know, it 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 is it has human characteristics. It's not necessarily quite human just yet, but it's still something that we can teach it, and it's still something that we can, you know, it's almost like a river rushing. We can still kind of somewhat steer it into a direction that is just and ethical for us all. Um, Especially since, you know, and now I'm going to go to the Bernie bro side of it, especially since we live in a capitalist system, you know, <laughs> where like, that's not how technologies tend to go. But there is also a palpable fear that I've encountered discussing with students as well, because one of the things we need to recognize as well is a lot of us are established in our careers. A lot of us, you know, have had, you know, the time to have experienced this. So there's a lot of, you know, like there, there is like this daunting thing that's coming up. And, and I know, Lauren, you've brought so many good points. And I hope that people who are newer to this industry listen to it. But I think it just, you know, a lot of it will do with, you know, ensuring that we have better rights that respect our labor, irregardless of, you know, where this technology goes or not. And, um, and also just to tell, you know, people to not give up their pencils or paintbrushes, because that's not <laughs> where, where we were a part of this too. Um, but to also embrace one of our best qualities, which is adaptability. And every time a new technology arises, there is always a sense of adaptability that we must embrace. And I think we are finding ourselves in that space. Um, I personally, and I know I'm taking a little bit of the time uh, and I'll, I'll see it in a second, but I personally believe that this particular thing is perhaps a little bit bigger than some of the previous advances. Um, but maybe that's just because this is my baby's first big advancement, you know? <laughs> Um, but I do find it uh, magnificent in its way of how much easier it is. All you, if you know how to write, you can, you know, 
ask the AI to create something for you. And that's pretty magnificent. But anyway, I kind of want to cede the ground to Nicole, Rachel, see if you guys have any more questions or anyone else who might have anything else that they wish oh, to say. Bobby has his hand raised. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just wanted to add, add something. And I think we've, we've sort of alluded to it at times, but then we've, we've, I think, slipped in our language as we've been discussing this. And I, I want to hopefully convey this so that we become more precise in how we talk about this. And that's when we're talking about AI capabilities, I think, you know, something, something that is fairly obvious to everybody here is that, you know, it is still a tool, obviously. But when we when we talk about this in the sense of, oh, you know, um, AI, uh, you know, uh, when, when, when you're talking about rights, consent, all of these things, the, the way we frame it, it's, it's not really, you know, the interaction with the AI system, but it's, it's more so the, the interaction with the processes, the policies, the actors around it who are actually, who designed, developed, and who are deploying and maintaining that AI system. I guess maybe I'm not, I'm not being as articulate as I would like to be, but essentially what I'm saying is that there are people behind these AI systems today and the agency responsibility, the question about whose rights, how they're being violated, everything that we're talking about here, we, I think we, we focus so much on that AI system and what it's capable of, what, what it's enabling, all of those things that we, 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 we should not forget that there are people behind the, these systems, these companies who are who are making these decisions on a daily basis. And they are, at least at the moment, the ones who we should be asking these hard questions of or involving or doing something where we're holding them accountable rather than strictly speaking only about the AI system. And, and yeah, sorry, I'm not being as articulate as I could, but I just want to emphasize that we should not forget that there are people behind these systems and ultimately they are who are, you know, who should be held accountable as well. Sorry, I see Craig, you have your hand up. Yeah, go for it, Craig. Yeah, uh, just to add to that is, you know, really big stuff used to be the province of governments, and now we have private individuals going to Mars and building AIs and GPT-3. These are in private hands. These are going to be very powerful and, you know, huge concentrations of wealth. And but they are not uh, accountable to democratic checks because they are not part of the government. And how to control that going forward is a is an issue for uh, all of AI. And actually, that's a, a a huge issue for government in general, as we do find ourselves in a position where government is lacking and lagging behind um, some of the things that we do need. Uh, Overall, go ahead, Frank. Um, yeah, I saw Iris had their hand up before me, though. Welcome, we... Iris. Hi, Iris. Hi. Uh, can I ask something? Of course. Okay. Uh, thanks. I had a question because, oh, by the way, I love what everybody's saying, and thank you for your information, especially Craig with the very forward-thinking response. Um, I'm just wondering because I wanted to start mentoring students soon and give them like a kind of approach to find their own voice in art. And this comes at a really weird time because I feel that I'm not sure if anything I say will be relevant anymore <laughs> in like even a year. So I don't know if I feel like I'm leading them into a dark abyss. So <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, about like what I know is any of it is any of my experience relevant anymore to share with a student or am I just kind of you know when you you're continuing on down a road that is just no longer going to be taken anymore what do you that's, think about that that's a that's an amazing question I do want to ask both Nicole and Rachel um, should we take Frank's last point and then move on? Because this feels like a natural well, transition I've, to a Q and A. Yeah. I think I actually have something to say to that as well. Okay. So oh, you know, I'll take it. my lawyer hat off for a moment and put my motivational speaker hat on. Um, you know, hearing some of the concerns here, I I definitely feel 
that some folks are jumping to a conclusion and downplaying the importance of individual individuality as artists. And I think that that's actually a key factor uh, in all of this. I think that no matter how the technology is used, there's going to be subtle distinctions between creative direction, uh, detail. You know, that we're talking about the very early stages of these tools. And when you put in a prompt, which is like five to 10 words, you end up with a scene. But it doesn't stop there. And actually, all of these tools are built to have iterations. It allows you to uh, draw on it. Uh, most of them do, or they have different versions of it. You can subtract certain parts. You can tell it to regenerate certain details. You can ask it to iterate and redo certain scenes. There's, you, know, you can do a thousand passes on an initial prompt that was only five or six words, but the end result is going to be exactly what you envisioned to see when, when this technology matures and it can recreate what you're trying to do. Um, and so even when there is the opportunity to recreate based on typing in an artist's name and say like their rendition of this scene, it's, it's, it's going to be so far into the future, I think, before it can ever capture the essence of that artist. It can be a good parody and it can do a general uh, interpretation of that. But when you're talking about commercial uses and your livelihoods, I don't think those are the scenarios that are gonna actually be what's litigated and what is really causing the problem. The company is using artists' work because of that artist and what the artist can do and the way the artist can receive that information and instruction and turn that into something that the person hiring them is really looking for. Uh, it's going to be very hard for AI tool, tools to replace that for the majority of commercial contexts. Um, you know, you, as as mentioned before, um, I totally Christian agree. Mentioned... Just just jumping in, one hundred percent. Go, Frank. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Three. Um, there's there's going to be certain uh, directors who have their own vision, and they'll be satisfied by a very rudimentary prompt that spits back something that meets their vision, but they're not. Uh, the target for your livelihoods and, and what you're trying to uh, be paid for. Those, those people aren't really appreciating the nature of your work anyway. Uh, there's going to be plenty of people who are looking for the more individualized touch, who are going to be looking for what you as an artist can do. And so going back to Iris's question, I mean, I think the individuality is always going to be there and these are going to continue to just be tools that evolve. Um, one last point to Craig. Um, and why we might have some more issues with these things. Um, it's a smaller fraction, but the individuality component is still there. And that's where the privacy questions come into play. Uh, misrepresentation of an artist. And, uh, you know, as these works get similar and more similar to what the artist is, and it becomes more believable for well-known artists that they generated something that might be inappropriate material or things like that. Um, it's pretty clear to me that the legal landscape still has protections on those kinds of misrepresentations, um, the uh, likenesses of licensed IP, uh, the uh, individual and uh, representations of them. So I think that the law uh, will continue to continue to evolve, but I think that those protections are still there, and it's really going to come down to uh, more egregious offenses and uh, misuse in commercial contexts where this problem is going to uh, arise. And you have, because this is private companies, you do have free market context here to govern. Um, just because it's not the government and there's no democratic process doesn't mean that some companies will come in and have good descriptions of what protections they put in place, how they're handling complaints, how they're receiving feedback, and other companies won't care at all. And those companies probably, probably won't be the ones succeeding in a commercial space themselves as well. So, uh, you know, continue asking these questions. I think it was a great uh, comment. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember who said it, but asking these questions of these companies and their representatives, finding out what their story is and really putting that out there so that uh, people can decide who to use. And then you won't have you know, uh, companies like, bad example maybe, but like Disney and Pixar using 
algorithms and companies behind these algorithms that present uh, public scrutiny and uh, you know tying themselves to these things as well. So um, you know, I think that there's a lot in play here. That once the dust settles, you'll realize that uh, it's not all doom and gloom for those who who are thinking that. Um, and there's always going to be a place for uh, the creative geniuses like yourselves. I um, oh, I wanted to oh, lower hand. Oh, thank you so much for that, Frank and and everybody. Um, to kind of um jump in on that really quickly just to, two two quick little notes um on a practical you know level um one of the best prompts that the best as someone mentioned here earlier but the best ai art that i've seen still is coming from artists so that knowledge that practical knowledge that understanding that's valuable immensely immensely valuable so that that knowledge cannot you know won't be lost anytime soon in fact it's the thing that creates so much so much uh wonder on the on the second point discussing you know just discussing in general um one of the things like abby and i have discussed earlier is um in one of our previous conversation is the idea of a code of conduct for you know ai researchers and for companies and companies do have like codes of conducts that they kind of, you know, work with each other because these are still like at the end of the day for profit enterprises. And while governments may not necessarily have the controls that or the regulations yet, because that's a big yet, these governing these companies are still for profit and they still respond to PR. It's a huge thing. So as a company, it's in your best interest to do right by the public whenever possible. Of course, in as a whole, that doesn't always work that way, as we all know. But in general, just asking for these companies and and you know and making sure that like these issues are heard and are discussed and are out in the open and are brought up, both you know by PR groups like ourselves, you know not ourselves, sorry, but like just conversations like these, PR groups, you know, organizing, you know reaching out to your communities that's important uh sorry i have to, i take i take so much time <laughs> anyway, so so with that said um rachel nicole should we then now transition to a proper q and r q and a unless yes unless right? someone yeah. wants to jump in from our panel before I just, I just wanted to jump in for one second because i see a lot of i've been trying to keep an eye on the chat um a lot of folks um and it's hard because i it's very hard to it, just to put people's minds at ease they keep saying you know well what's what's the difference between these ai images and and again they're going to get better of course they're going to get better but like right now like i can spot an ai image a mile away they all have the same slickness they all have the same look like you know and that'll change over time but again it's the artists that are taking them these images away from that thing but when, there's there's a joke going around and i know some of the folks here uh, certainly saw it or heard it or contributed to it but like you need to put a prompt into an ai and that depends on a client knowing what the fuck they want <laughs> and that is the hardest part of the job and i'm not you know I'm not selling my editors down the river or anybody else or any client. I work with wonderful clients, but you know, the ability for them to tell you exactly what they want is 90% of the job sometimes, you know? So yes, will people go in and play with these AI tools who are not artists? You still need an artist to translate what you say kind of into the image that you want. Yes, you can give words to an AI and it will kick back many, many images, but you know, that it, look, I think, I think we're safe, you know? Um, but that being said, the, the, the other thing is like an AI, you know, whatever the data set is, whatever the th these things are, it's gonna, they're all remixes. And I am not getting into the, the, the copyright issue or anything like that here. I just mean, conceptually, there are remixes of what has happened before. If you are looking for innovation, if you are looking for something new and fresh and something you haven't seen before, that is not something you're gonna get from putting prompts into an AI. It might be a starting point, And that's why I think this is potentially a great tool. Um, 
I've already seen a ton of artists using it for inspiration, for sketching, for hashing out ideas. I see people using it for rough storyboarding, things like that. Um, but if you are looking for something unique and something that has a new voice, you're not, you're not going to get it all the way there from an AI. Maybe it's 25% of the way there, maybe it's 50% of the way there, like a stock image. But anyway, that, that's all I had to say. So like, you know, I, I, I don't want people to keep panicking that an AI, these AI systems, like, look, I, I don't know how many, what the one-to-one -one ratio is of people panicking and if those people have actually played with these tools yet. But, you know, if you are really panicking and scared of these things, go play with one. And I honestly, I think it'll, I think it'll make you feel better, not worse. Thank you. Um, I, 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 I would, I know we have to transition, but I would like to hear from kind of like closing statements. Do we have time for that, Nicole? For well, Craig's gone. Craig's uh, gone. Yeah. Oh no, my <laughs> heart. Oh, poor Craig. I think just because we're at yeah. time, like, I, yes, I we are. Yeah. So let's, let's take some questions. Um, unless Carla, did you have a closing or how about, do you want to take some questions and then we do a closing statement or. Yeah. Well, I, I want to be mindful of our guests this time. Um, yeah. I know not everybody can stay poor Craig, <laughs> sweetie. Um, well, Bean's had his hand raised for a while now. So I'm going to ask him and I apologize yeah. if that's how you pronounce your name. Um, but it is your turn, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's close. It's Bien. It means ocean in Vietnamese. Um, but yes, Bien is close. Um, hey gang, um, thanks for doing this. Uh, it's good to see so many familiar names and faces in this conversation. Um, for the past several years, I've been helping out with startup companies and pilot projects with design and direction, ranging from tech in the Silicon Valley to biomed and such. And what I've learned is that AI like this isn't new by any means. It's just in different or earlier stages. And Frank, I, I've worked in a lot of livery services like Flywheel when Uber and Lyft were up and coming. So I hope that it can relate to what you've got going on. Um, I've been following... Uh, general adversarial network projects like NVIDIA's imaging and StyleGAN and such when they came into play for um, years now. And uh, this has been something that's been more prevalent in industrial and prosthetic manufacturing, for example. Um, they've been utilizing systems like this for nearly a decade, um, but where instead of relying on maps and sourcing images and references and whatnot, they do a lot more in math functions like L systems and other equations top of photogrammetry. And like Lauren said earlier, there are a lot of concerns for protection. And as someone who's worked in, as a special operations lead and creative director, solving for efficiency is key. And these tools are significant in early discovery conversations in, term, in terms of saving time on manual labor in pre-production. So the less time we spend finding clarity, the more time we're able to get to the projects and what we love doing. So my question is, maybe you can help me with this, Frank, or anyone who may know, is whether or not there have been legal precedences or anything set in the past decade um, from these other sectors or tangential industries that we can refer to or rely on as a basis or foundation for future uh, security when it comes to protecting artists and making sure that we're not infringing on anyone's rights or works. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if anybody else has any more specific examples to share. Um, <clears throat> I am, I'm not aware of very clear precedent on, uh, on these particular topics that that you're mentioning, but. I will just reiterate that you know existing copyright law, existing uh, licensing, which is really ultimately contract law, um, those things are going to be what a lot of the major uh, challenges and legal challenges are going to funnel into. Um, it's the same basic principles that you know people who have created something have certain protections over the the work that they've created, and uh, the release of those rights are still going to come down to where they've shared them and uh, how it's collected from there. Uh, like I said at the beginning, I'm not an IP expert. Uh, my, the majority of my work is around privacy. And I think the privacy world, unfortunately, is, is very infantile in uh, the litigation that's taken place so far. Um, so, you know, there's not clear precedent in, uh, 
in these particular issues, they're starting to become some of this stuff in uh, AI ethics and, and biases. Um, the, the, that's definitely an area where this is coming up a lot in a lot of different contexts. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have more specifics for you. Um, but you know, if I, if I happen across something, I, I'll certainly forward to the group and, and through Carla in the future. It's, thank you, Frank. Um, Carla, mm -hmm. I think one of the things I would like us to address, just I don't know if you've been looking in the chat, um, but we've tried very hard to bring a balanced, calm perspectives to all of you. Mm -hmm. Consent is incredibly important to us. Like Rachel and I are wives of artists. Like we really, the ability to opt in or opt out is something I think that should personally, me as an individual, um, is something that we should be asking for. Um, do we have an answer on how to do that? No. So part of this was absolutely like, here's some of the facts. Here's the process. Here's Carla presenting in a cohesive way. What now? You know. So I'm putting a link in the chat to a Google form um, that's basically saying, Rachel and I can email you about any further um, conversations about this topic. But to us, this was a really important first step. So please, those of you in the chat, don't be disheartened. We, we do care. That's why we're having this conversation. Um, but we also, it, it's irresponsible to be like, the world is ending Skynet for us, you know, type of thing. So that that's not, we're always coming from a place of solution and positivity and protection because we're an advocacy organization and we care about all of you and your jobs and the future of the industry. And so that's why it was important to bring together this balanced, diverse panel. And to add further up to that, just because that's such a great, wonderful point, um, a ther wonderful therapist once said the most contagious emotions are fear and anxiety. And I cannot imagine us in a group like that, that contagious happening. But another thing that's really important, said therapist also, is the idea of not getting ahead of ourselves too much, um, not thinking of absolutes. We are going to die. We are going to, you know, the, the worst possible case, because we, you know, it, it, it serves, it, it's not, the, f the future isn't set in stone. There, there, and it's, and it's easier. And I think much personally for me, much more effective to tackle the issues with a more, Hey, there's positive, there's negative, what are the issues? How can they be solved? What can we do? And as Nicole mentioned, even just signing up for, you know, a, a forum where we maintain communication, that's a huge way to maintaining, you know, that organized community, which will be pivotal in the coming years of this, you know, to ensure that we have good protections. So yeah. don't get ahead of ourselves. It's, it's, I think the I think the not to jump in again. I'm sorry. I, so I I care so much, especially yeah. about like calming people. But like, I think the distinction that I've been I've been trying to make when I have these conversations, and I I think a lot of us feel this way. The problem is not actually AI. The problem is how our society treats and values artists. So that's a whole nother panel. And I am 100% not concerned really and not scared and not panicky about AI. I am concerned and panicky and scared of how our society, especially speaking from a person sitting in the United States, of how we treat artists and how we value artists. And that's not AI. That's, oh, I mean, it is AI, but it's AI. It's Google image search and people stealing stuff. It's Fiverr charging $5 for logos. And so the problem to me, if I'm not trying to say there's not a problem, but the problem is not AI. The problem is how we value art in our society currently. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to be, um, misrepresenting the fact that I don't think there's a problem. I think there's a bigger problem. I don't think AI is the problem. I think it's something we absolutely have to push back on and and like any new technology, you know, um, try to force to be as ethical as possible. But the problem is bigger than, than AI. Plus a million to that, but yes. Yeah, I mean, that's why we're here. I mean, that's why Concept Art Association got involved in this, because it is about the artist, the copyright, the consent. So, yeah, for anyone that's upset, this is a starting point.
Yeah. Um, but I'd love to get through some more questions. Um, who was up next? Oh man, you guys are killing me with the names. I, um, I saw Stefan raise his hand earlier. Yeah, I mean, is this is this honor system though? Like, because I kind of remember Gabriel and Frank and Leah. I, but yeah, I, I think it's. I, I not, think I was not. I was not first in line, so yes, honor system would be would be fair. Okay. Yeah, I think it was Liad. Yeah. Hello, I have to run really soon, but thank you so much, Carla, for doing this and putting this on. Um, Concept Art Association too. Yes. Um, my question is, I've heard uh, a lot of people, like a lot of people on Twitter and stuff are comparing, um, you know, the AI, how it learns to how people learn and the, making the comparison that, well, people learn from copyrighted images. So what's the difference? And I, you know, I think there's a difference. I don't look at, you know, 5 billion images at once uh, to make my stuff. And the product itself seems to be the AI, not the images it produces. So that's also a difference. But um, since we have an expert here on some of this stuff, I thought it would be a great uh, question to ask. Yeah, that's fantastic. Abby, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, and also, yeah. I want to hear from Christian on this too. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, that that's a that that's a great question, and and I think you you pretty much I think nailed it on the head that you know we don't we don't take five billion images to to learn right, and um and and the fact that it's being packaged up and and sold as a service with I think unclear sources and unclear I I genuinely mean that unclear in the sense that. It, 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 you know, I think Frank was saying that earlier, right? Like it's not, it, we're not a hundred percent on, uh, you know, what the state of affairs is, whether, you know, copyright, uh, you know, which of these images are copyrighted and, uh, you know, what, what the implications of that are when you have learned representations and, and what the outputs are going to be and, and all of those things. So, yeah, I don't know if I can like if if there's a if there's a concrete answer or satisfactory answer that I can I can give. I think it's just it, for me it keeps coming back to whether we're doing enough to hold the people who are developing these systems and putting them out into the world for commercial consumption accountable for what they're doing if we find you know issues with this are we doing enough to to hold them accountable and that's that's sort of the the recurring theme in addition to everything else that's been said which i 100 percent agree with christian do you have anything to add um yeah i i don't know for me i i kind of feel like if if it really would you know i'm going to say the most american thing in the room and say the the market will decide you know um, maybe it's sort of Republican, which I'm not, but, um, like if people decide that these, this, this is the kind of content they want, you know what I mean? If, if, you know, I keep thinking of like, would I want to read an, an AI written comic book, you know, if, if the, because, you know, it's only a matter of time before AI is writing and illustrating and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the answer is no, maybe f as a lark, you know, I would like, oh, let's see what this would, it, it's, it, you're actually getting to know people for, through their illustrations, through their images, through their writings, through their films, you're, it, it's, it's not unlike, you know, uh, it, 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 it's social, it's, it's a way of social interaction. So I think there will be a, a small group of people that that are really into the tech, that are really interested and they'll love to read an autobiography by an AI, which that actually sounds like it might be interesting. But, um, but I think for the most part, we, we connect with other people through art. Um, we don't connect with computers. So there you go. Thank you. Anyone have any thoughts on this or should we continue? Let's on? just keep, let's keep moving. Let's go, let's go. Yeah, 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 Frank. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they've, they've been so <laughs> patiently you. waiting with that. I know. Up. So, Frank, hi. Hi. Um, so I'm coming at this from a, from a kind of strange place. I'm an artist, but I'm also pursuing my master's degree in psychology. 
And um, part of the work that I was just doing in psychology was looking at um, uh, something called de-individuation, which is where anonymity meets arousal, where like when people get mad. And it takes place in like games like Fortnite, where like you're hiding behind a mic and how players behave in that game. And I only bring this up because when people created that game, um, they didn't think about how toxic that game could become when you gave eight-year-olds Uzis and set them loose in an open world together. And um, really the takeaway from all of that and what I really wanted to say here was that releasing a game like that without those kind of ethical constraints built in from the ground up is kind of like trying to put aftermarket brakes on a car that can do 90 miles an hour. Like if the car wasn't built for it, trying to add those limitations in later on becomes much, much, much harder. And I mean, in terms of the speed the technology grows, I mean, we have to remember that from the time that the internal combustion engine was invented to the time we were on the moon was 65 years. Like it's, it's the, our ability to leap technologically is, is, can be exhilarating and terrifying at the same time. So I'm not trying to be an alarmist or anything, but I've seen industries kind of like, not collapse, but shift dramatically. Like uh, when I came up through publishing, there were still paste up artists, people who would literally use paste on the back of something and then like put it on a board and then take that thing into a room and photograph that page to be printed in something else. And then there was a Mac SE30 with, with a 30 megabyte hard drive that eliminated everybody's jobs overnight. And so I, I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be an alarmist or anything, but I also don't want to under. Um, it didn't eliminate everybody's jobs though. They were different jobs. Those jobs changed. Certainly people who didn't learn computers were unfortunately and probably inhumanely gotten rid of, but that didn't happen overnight. I mean, I worked in publishing, I was trained in paste up and then, you know, worked in digital. That's, it's, you're like the, the computer doesn't run itself. There's still people, myself included, that work in publishing that do layouts. We just don't use glue, we use Photoshop. For this, this goes sure. back to the conversation of how we treat artists. Right, right, well, that's the thing. Like when, um, you know, when we, when we came into desktop publishing with, you know, with, you know, Aldous PageMaker, you know, it, 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 it transformed things in a way that, yeah, people, People had to learn how to use the computer, but like, you know, there were separate departments previously where you had a linotype operator and you had somebody who would flow text for you. And now you had one person doing several of those jobs. Anyway, uh, I, I don't want to get too deep into that. What I, I just wanted to say that any kind of ethical constraints built into these AIs needs to be built in at the ground level, um, at the initial phase so that, you know, people's, um, people's particular styles or whatever, are, you have an, an opportunity to opt in rather than being forced to opt out later. Thank you for sharing with us today. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think the, the, the idea that um, the market will protect individual workers is a, a difficult one because I don't think that that has proven to be true. Um, so, so I agree with you absolutely. These systems, and again, again, it's a society problem. The, the, we need to be in a society where, and things like GDPR make me feel like, you know, there are at least sections of this society that are, are moving there, that these, these breaks need to be put on things before they're out in the world. And our, so certainly in the US, our model is to put stuff out there and then only rein it back when we're forced to by lawyers, which is a shitty version. No offense, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> None taken. Uh, it's been called no, worse. No, no, I was, uh, no, no, no. I was just, I was, no, I was lauding the lawyers. They're the ones yeah. that are protecting us. No, 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 for sure, for sure. No, I'm, I'm just joking. I'm just, no, I'm but, but all of these companies no, are trying to get away with something yes. because the lawyers haven't caught up to them yet. Yes, and that that's exactly what I wanted to build yeah. up on that from your point, Lauren. And it's a good one because it's just like one of those things where it's like, Ask, ask with the case of like, again, check it out, FTC and Ever Album. And I know the EU itself has also had similar cases where, you know, you have these companies, they're, they're, 
getting all excited. And the way that I kind of see the AI space right now, it's everyone's kind of stuck in the arms race, racing to see who will gain dominance over the space. So there aren't a lot of thoughts and, you know, constraints given to, you know, what, what to do. They're just like, oh, let's just do it. Let's just go really quick. Go, go, go. Um, but I do think the law and regulations will catch up to it in one way or another. I'm, I'm not sure if those, we, we have fantastic people like Abhishek, which I think he might have left. Unfortunately, we're past our time. So a lot of our guests do need, do have other, you know, things, but um, with, which Abhishek is a part of the Montreal AI Institute, Ethics Institute, um, which does advocate for ethics within that industry. And one of the things I want to push on everybody as well is it's important throughout the building of all of this, I've also been talking to developers. I've also been talking to some of the people who had these companies. Sometimes the conversations are fruitful. Sometimes they're a little bit difficult because you're, you're telling someone who is so excited and passionate about all this new stuff and you know, plain speaking as well, potential profits to be made that you don't wanna tell them, hey, 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 whoa, look at this, this, this could be a problem. And no one likes to hear that, regardless of whether you're a developer or an artist or anything like that, when there's something really exciting. But it is important to have these conversations with, you know, developers. It is important to have, you know, reach out and be like, hey, this is a problem. It has to be fixed. How is your industry doing that? There has to be that level of accountability. Um, and it's, it's just like many different strategies that we're going to find ourselves engaged in, whether it's waiting for the law to catch up, whether it's building public awareness, whether it's reaching out to all the different communities set up, you know, to be, you know, to, to, to be impacted in one way or another by these technologies and the people building these technologies themselves, both collaborating or, and, or holding them accountable whenever possible. So there will be just a lot of work in this. So I, I hope that you can all, you know, just to say this is the first of many, many, many things we will do together as a community. And I don't, I'm not speaking for the Concept Art Association. Uh, I'm just speaking as the illustration, concept art, creative industries as a whole. What were um, you yes, we, we're, here for, we're here for it. Um, Stephen. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfectly. Um, so thank you so much for having this. It's already been an amazing conversation. Um, one, I, my, my question of what I'm, the issue I'm going to introduce, it's very practical. Um, I read like the last three work agreements I've had with my studio production counterparts. And I basically read the NDA confidentiality agreement in the, in those work agreements and those work deals. As I understand it in my non-lawyer brain, I am not allowed to use any of these right now in my workflow. I can't present, I cannot walk into an office with a hundred, like an art department meeting with a hundred mid journey images. I'm not allowed. I'm complete violation of my NDA and my confidentiality boundaries as they've been set right now today, you know, uh, with the studio system that I work with. So I can't use this for work. I, I understand it's, extremely entertaining to use it as an art. And I trust me, I, I'm on Discord like everyone else. Like, oh, that's cute. That's cool. You know, Muppet Indians, whatever. But uh, it's like right now, you know, I'm, I'm also, you know, I, I don't think we're going back. I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle. This is going to be part of our lives. And I'm assuming at some point through whether, whether it's going to be through acquisitions, some huge company is going to buy Midjourney or Dali or whatever, someone, and they're going to create, they're going to talk to the studios and there's going to be a secure pipeline in which you can then work on your movie, use AI and present it in art department meetings. I'm assuming that that's going to happen. I don't have a timeline. I, you know, I'm not smart enough or know enough about the technology to figure out when that's going to happen, but I'm assuming, I, I live with the assumption that it's going to happen at some point. Um, Getting to Lauren's really, really good point about how our society values artists. And I think there's a lot of fear that comes from the idea. We used, you got, we've all, for those of us who, you know, who, who live in the art world, there's always like that, that meme of the Venn diagram that we always get a chuckle out of, of like, you know, cheap, fast, and good, pick two, right? And I think a lot of people are terrified, like, oh, cheap, fast, and good, you can have it. Like, 
you can have all three, right? And all of a sudden our incomes drop because it's a race to the bottom, right? The like AI is now going to like, it's going to, I don't, I don't think the word is democratized, but it's gonna be very, very easy to create complex images that normally you would have to pay a, someone who went to art center, who's now like 200 K in debt, <laughs> you know, is now trying to like, you know, pay off. Right. And now they're, now they're up against some kid, you know, in Czechoslovakia and some kid in Poland, who's a prop star, you know what I mean? And it, it, I think that it's like, what is our, I think we're all kind of staring at the, we're all standing around this crib, staring at this newborn uh, entity, right? It, it's, that is currently still like it's brand new like you know it's not about now it's about five years from now like what's it gonna be and i think it's really impossible in some ways to say other than i know it's gonna live i know it's not leaving you know and uh, how it's how it grows and what it becomes i think is it, it, i think yeah it is you do have to get lawyers and you do have to like create parameters around it and i don't know maybe you do maybe you do create like you know, there are nonprofit people who basically say like, they can, they can call them like getting in at the ground level and they can come and say, Carla, you can say, I want Carla Ortiz removed from all databases of all of these companies. You know what I mean? And for instance, you know, so I would love to hear what anybody who's currently working in, in one of the, you know, the union studio art department, how they perceive AI in their workflow. And are you allowed to use it? Cause I know judging from my, the language in my agreements, I'm certainly not right now. I can step in and say, as far as our, you know, speaking generally to publishing contracts, um, and I think which is the case for any industry that uh, takes a finished piece of art from an artist, which is a lot of times different from concept art, like that. I'm talking to to companies that that piece of art you get from the artist is go, is the product. Um, yeah. The artist. I would say universally on every all of these contracts is um, responsible for delivering a piece of art that is free of other copyrights, which means you didn't trace it over a picture, you know, um, you didn't uh, photo bash it, you didn't, you know, all of those things, or if you did it, you did it so well that nobody can figure it out, you know, um, and I think AI is, is going to fall under the same thing, which means that is it is it going to be mood boarded? Yeah, I can't wait for my, you know, the first mood board, you know, AI generated mood board piece to come in from an author. I'm sure that that's coming, but it's not the 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 final. I'm saying right now, legally, it cannot be the final image because it is not clear necessarily clear of copyright. It's too new and it's too gray. So to that point, even if it's not the final image, let's say I use Mid Journey, then I did like I did 90% Mid Journey, you know, diffusion and then a 10% Photoshop finish, right? I'm still having that work done outside of my machine, my technology ecosystem and the technology ecosystem of the studio, right? Somebody else is making that image. As it, I, am I wrong? Am I, is it somebody else is making it right now, right? The, another technology, somebody outside of the studio and outside of my office is making the image and sending it back to me. I think it depends on your copyrights and I'd love to hear what the, the concept art people yeah, but, think about this, but, like, but to me, it would be like using a piece of stock art. You, you can use stock art as long as you have the rights from that stock art agency to use that piece of stock art, but it is part of your job to pass along the licensing information of the images that you used to get right. to your art. Okay. Yeah, some of the tools that we're talking about here can actually be run on your own machine. So even though it's using the data set that has been collected and scraped more globally and external to your ecosystem, it can right. actually be performed on your machine. And in that sense, it's more of a tool. Right. Uh, but I think what you're highlighting in, in the NDA is very interesting to me. I think you're probably talking about a, a larger company with a yeah. lot of legal brains behind them yeah. uh, thinking through this and thinking, how can this bite them in the ass from a risk standpoint? They're just trying to secure their images. Right. If the things, if it's a big IP and it's not coming out for two years, they don't want anything being made somewhere else. They right? don't want any traceability of it that. because yeah. they're aware they of how big the risks server. are. They yeah. don't want it on a server that they don't have access to, that they don't control, and they don't know who who runs it. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? I can 
I'll say I've worked with big, 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 huge corporate clients that, you know, they do straight up ask you, like, have you photo bashed this, you know, sure. like, because they want to make sure that like, it's there, they cannot, they, they do not want to be held liable for any kind of infringement, even if it seems like, even if you could argue, I mean, yeah, I, I photo bashed, but I painted over it. Like, even that on like, you know, teams of lawyers and company in large corporations are just like this is that so i you know of course this is all a developing space so we we don't you know there will be things that will be explored there will be cases i'm sure but but as of right now it's just like from my experience working with these companies it's i i wouldn't that's that's all i can say and just to elaborate, because I'm a producer and I um I, I specialize in marketing. I've worked in gaming and all the things, right? Um, so part of the reason with photo bashing is every time I wanted to put forth an image and artists said that they photo bashed, I then had to pay our junior counsel hours and hours and hours to right. go through and try to find every single image. And it's already expensive enough for me to commission an artist and the artist's time and what have you, an art director's time, but lawyers are very expensive. And so it just comes down to maybe instead of 10 spaceships I wanted to show, I can only afford them to photo bash source three of them. And so it's, it's more of just like a hours of time. Hmm. And I realized I answered photo bashing, not AI. I just imagine that that's kind of the same logic, right? It, it turns from a legal standpoint. Should we... Thank you so much for your question and everyone's answers. Stefan, I know you've had the, wait, honor system. Who was first, Stefan or Gabrielle? I think it was Stefan. Stefan, yeah. For sure. I have the memory of a goldfish, my bad. All right, hi, Stefan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfectly. Oh, great, yeah. Oh, wow, well, man, I was gonna say it was, it's so much, so much to talk about. Uh, I don't even know where to start. Um, I, I had my I had my thoughts on one thing I wanted to say, <laughs> and then in the course of like 15, 20 minutes, it's going to change. Uh, I, I think the first thing I want to say, just just to uh, add on to the points of how the studio operates to protect, it's not really how much their image, more than it is their, their, their wallet, uh, and to Lauren's points, I've seen that happening uh, recently, and I think it's going to become a trend where studio have you sign a first contract where you're already stating and being very clear that you're not using anything that's an infringement to anything you know, copyrighted. But once you've created a work that is being used in a, in a project, they have you sign a second contract to make sure that you really understand what you've used is not infringing on anything. And they are requesting that you also upload the images that you use to create that image if you used any kind of photo bashing which is actually very smart because it forces you and artist to be very responsible and use it to make something as an image that you would use like a photo stock, your own. You're creating something as a reference, but you are making a big difference to make sure that it is not that reference that you're using and smashing into the image, but you are creating something that becomes your own, that there's no, there's no issue at the end. So that, that, that's one thing I just wanted to point out because I've seen that happen, you know, recently in these big, big, you know, film contracts. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is like, you know, it's, it's to the point of what, you know, uh, Christian was saying and Lauren too, uh, the debate is, I think it's very relevant, but I think it's like you said, the, the future is not set, but the future is also what we make of it. And, and as a community, I think it is our responsibility to teach the younger regeneration and also talk between ourselves about these kinds of issues so that when there is a fear that arises like these new things about the AI, which honestly, I don't see any different from Photoshop. It's just a question of knowledge to conversations and teaching people about what it is all about and, 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 and understanding how you use the, the tool to diffuse the fear to make something like that new technology part of your everyday tool set so that you can use it without being worried about it, which is what we all learn as artists when the photography came in, when Photoshop came in, when every new technology changed the way we were, came in and forces us to adapt. So that, that's, that's just my two cents. 
Thank you for that. Um, yeah, thanks, Stefan. Yeah. Also, hi. <laughs> hi. Hi, Lord. Yeah, I, no, I, and Stefan and I have worked on a ton of book covers, and if if he used, you know, stock imagery, he would need, even if it was, you know, completely licensed by him and he was copyright clear, he would need to give me that image so that I could pass it on to foreign, foreign licensees and anybody who used that image. And, and, and to Nicole's point, it is a giant pain in the ass and an expense to track that stuff. Well, it forces you also to become your own artist, to be, to be you and not just someone else. In the case of AI, why would you want the AI to do your job? I mean, inspiration is great, but inspiration is that. It's inspiration. After that, you take it, it's a tool, and you make it your own to become your own artist. If, if, if you don't go beyond that, then, you know, there is no really any answers here. You know, it has to move beyond all that stuff. Thank you. Uh, does this mean Gabrielle will be the last question? Yes. We're very close to time and then we'll do a closing statement. Hi. Go ahead, um, Gabrielle. No. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to share uh, because I was on Instagram right before this and uh, I don't know if anybody follows Don Allen III, but he does like all this XR creation, uh, lots of AI, AR, VR stuff. Um, and so he was like showing some new feature of Dolly 2. And apparently he's gonna do a, an interview tomorrow with people from, or somebody from OpenAI. So I figured uh, since we're having these important conversations right now, uh, that if anybody's interested, they should definitely check out the live interview that he's gonna have tomorrow on Instagram and bring these ethical questions to uh, one of the people who works at OpenAI. Um, ask them the tough questions. So uh, yeah, that's tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. And I put it in the chat before. I'm gonna, uh, I'll paste the info again. Um, but yeah, that's Don, Don Allen III uh, on Instagram. Yeah, that's all I want to say. No, that's, that's, that's a great, um, that's a great thing to share because I, I feel like there's something about the internet that allows us to kind of step away from the, you know, both the humanizing, but also it's kind of like a mixture of like, you're both like making someone be way more powerful as a legend than they are, or you turn them into like the most evil, evil thing, you know, just because they're, they're a profile, you know, they're a, a something, someone behind the screen, but reaching out and talking to these people in a, in a, in a way that's, you know, polite, but firm and being like, Hey, listen, this is exciting, but here are the ethical concerns. What are you and your company doing to tackle those? That's pretty huge. I've, I've found in my experience and conversations of technologies like these, that most of the people in charge of it, for the most part, right? And I'm talking about the people, not the actual corporation that is for profit and that's their sole purpose, but the people tend to be very, like, they, they tend to be surprised when you hit them up with like, hey, have you thought that this perhaps isn't ethical? Have you thought that perhaps this, this particular practice needs to be thought about further? And whether they agree or disagree, they'll at least have to come up with an answer and think about it. And it gets the conversation out there. So attending these events is really, really important. Um, I'll, I'll try and see if I can listen in. Um, I do um, uh, want to kind of ask anybody any last notes or anything at all before, you know, I kind of close, close things out for, for everybody. All right. Well, first and foremost, I just I, I want to I will I will shower all the beautiful guests with all my love in just a second because they really do deserve all of the love. But I um, but I do want to make a really, really, really quick point, something that I've encountered a lot in my conversations these past two weeks. And I've had so many conversations and so many of you is the the dis 
despair and the feeling of there is nothing we can do. And I could not disagree with that more. There is so much we can do. It feels like, you know, like we're so used to things like, oh, like this massive, powerful entity just took over and I have to deal with that. Uh, but that's not the case here. These are very outside of Dali, which is a massive company. And even still, they're accountable. Like most of these developing teams are really, really, really tiny. And they're just getting started. So the time to have these conversations is right now. And even if they got really, really, really big, there is still so much that we can do as a community, whether it be to launch PR campaigns, whether it be to like lean on and support the organizations doing the work, whether it be organizing with each other, bringing these matters to press, to you know, government, pushing them to do responsible policy. There is so much we can do. It's, I always tell artists, please like, just like work what go one day do a political campaign get trained in union you know get trained in those and you'll see that that process of action be demystified in real time and it's important that we all again don't get ahead of ourselves don't you know think of the worst possibility let's be practical and think of the real issues we face without giving in to our anxiety and our fear this could be a very wonderful thing, or it could be really difficult, but it really depends on us and the actions we take um, and the way we can raise an alarm and bring people together. Hippy dippy, I know, but, <laughs> but now with that said, holy moly, I want to curse so bad. I'm so excited that all of you took the time to be here. Thank you so much to Christian Alsman, who's no longer here, Craig Mullins, who had to leave as well, Abhishek Gupta, Frank Ganello, Lauren Pinto. Thank you to our fantastic guests. You guys have given us so much to think about, so much of your time, so much of your expertise, and it's just been fantastic. Thank you to all of you who asked these wonderful questions, who gave us your perspective. And above all, thank you so much to Nicole and Rachel Minerding. And, you know, for and the concept art association you are all without you this would have never even happened so i'm just an absolute love and an awe of all of you and and, and the, all of you carla, without you this would have never happened. seriously carla like yeah. <laughs> you did all the work all the work and you no. made it pretty for us to all understand so no. and just your your willingness to have these conversations publicly and to reach out and say hey instead of like flailing what what do the Dali people think? What do the Midjourney people think? You know, I, I thank you so much for, um, you know, because your initial conversations on Twitter is what made me want to write the Muddy Colors post and what start you know brought this group together. I mean, it you're absolutely right. Like just just being willing to have, you know, open conversations mm -hmm. that aren't you know just like yelling and panicking on Twitter is mm -hmm. is so much more helpful and and. Yeah enriching <laughs> thank you so thank much. you no oh, thank you and i forgot to thank someone really important thank you all of you for coming in today to all the people who tuned in today without you we wouldn't also without the interest without your support we wouldn't have been here thank you um nicole rachel do, do we have an uh this will be recorded and yeah. any any closing like yeah just we will record this was recorded it will be uploaded on on our youtube channel hopefully by the end of the week um i can't say for sure that there will be no town hall ever again i think this is obviously a long you know bigger conversation that we kind of really just scratched the surface today um it was meant to be a space for people to kind of bring their opinions that hopefully empowers and gets people thinking about perhaps a different perspective right so I know we were wanting like actionable items, um, but it's it's bigger than that, right? Um, so hopefully this is enough to get people talking, thinking about it and kind of ad starting to advocate outside of Carla, who has done so much work for this, for making these connections um, so that we can all go out and utilize our own connections. <laughs> and um, yeah, 
So let's I, I just, just kind of keep continuing this conversation. I just, I just have to laugh at that because I'm just like, please, I just want to be an artist who stays in. I know you're like, I just, I'm, <laughs> you're like, I want to take a nap now. I'm very tired. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and also like at the, if, if this is it, like, it's been a scary couple years for sure. So I think, and it's come up in the chat a couple of times that you know we're reacting to threats so much with so much more panic than we did maybe three years ago you know just because of the mental health toll that the world has put on us in the last couple of years so also like you know take breaks make art like don't look at these issues and go oh my god i'm never going to make art again what's the point a robot's going to replace me you don't you know like make art it's it's also therapeutic you also we're all artists you also make art for you that's how we cope that's how we we deal with this stuff so don't let the threat of you know terminator the ai generated art robot you know stop you from from making art you know absolutely and just a reminder if this was your first time in hearing about conspire association we are an advocacy organization um, we do monthly events. Um, we're going to be at Lightbox Expo, the Concept Art Awards, which is the first award show just for concept artists and visual development artists. Um, happens at Lightbox Expo every year. Please, if you're there, attend. It's free. Um, and we have a drink and draw the Thursday before if you're in town, um, from out of town, please come. And uh, looking forward to seeing people in person again. It's going to be so nice to just be able to see people. And I, I'm just very excited for that.